Welcome to First United Lutheran Church. I am so glad you guys are here. A few quick notes before we jump into today's service. First of all, I want to welcome you wherever you are from, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, wherever it is that we find you today, know that you are a beloved child of God and that you are loved. In addition, just a few notes about today's service. We do have virtual communion um, in which we will go to that near, nearing sort of the end of service. Uh, so make sure you have your bread and your uh, liquid of the vine. So usually that'd be wine or grape juice available uh, for that part of the service when we get there. And I'll bring it back up right beforehand. So don't worry. Uh, just so you know, there is an adult ed opportunity every Thursday evening over Zoom. You can always find that Zoom link either in the events page on Facebook or through Constant Contact. If you can't figure out how to do either, just call the office. They will get you directed in the right direction or contact me or say something in the comments line. Uh, we're definitely willing to work with you um, to help uh, get you connected. Uh, with all that said, I hope you guys have a wonderful week and I hope your week is blessed and I hope that today starts that week off with a wonderful worship experience. Have a great day and God bless. Now for confession and forgiveness. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion, fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash in the cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace by the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and the power of God. Your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen.
Now for the prayer of the day. O God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made the instrument of your shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. An introduction for our first lesson. As with Noah, God makes an everlasting covenant with Abraham and Sarah. God promises this old couple that they will be the ancestors of nations, though they have no child together. God will miraculously bring forth new life from Sarah's womb, the name changes emphasize the firmness of God's promise. The first lesson is from the 17th chapter of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This ends the first lesson. An introduction for our second lesson. Paul presents Abraham as the example for how a person comes into a right relationship with God, not through the works of the law, but through faith. Though Abraham and Sarah were far too old for bearing children, Abraham trusted that God would accomplish what God had promised to accomplish. The second lesson is from the fourth chapter of Romans. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. 
For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, for he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. This ends the second lesson. An introduction for our gospel lesson. After Peter confesses his belief that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus tells his disciples for the first time what is to come. Peter's response indicates that he does not yet understand the way of the cross that Jesus will travel. The Gospel Lesson According to the Gospel of Mark, Chapter 8 Glory to you, O Lord. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the, the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them it to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. All right, kids, it's time for the children's sermon. So please come forward or grab the device out of your mom and dad's hand or move closer to the television, even if your mother or father says you aren't supposed to be that close. Go ahead for just a few minutes. So here's the thing. Today we're going to be talking about faith. Faith is like this core thing in Christianity. It's about do you believe in God? Um, the, the tricky thing about faith is faith is like a muscle. You got to exercise it, right? Or the muscle gets weak. So when you're talking about faith and when you're thinking about faith, what you got to do is think about ways in which you can exercise your faith. Um, and so what I'm going to do is invite you to do something this week, even if it's an itty bitty exercise in faith that you otherwise wouldn't have done. So if you pray every night at dinner, that doesn't count because you're already doing it, right? But if you don't pray at dinner, try that sometime this week. That's a nice little exercise of faith. Or do you pray at bedtime? If you pray, if you normally pray at bedtime, okay, that's good. You're already doing it, but do something different. If you don't pray at bedtime, give it a shot. It's actually really cool. Or in the morning or read your Bible or have your parents read you a Bible. I know we send them out to like all the kiddos, right? Take a moment, do that just like once this week and work out those faith muscles. Because the thing about faith is it's just like muscles. If you don't work them, it gets weak over time. All right, go ahead, sit back down, hang out with your parents, uh, and I hope you have a great week. Um, God bless. Bye. So today I'm going to 
do a sermon very differently than I normally do one. Um, this text from the gospel today, this idea of losing your life to save it, um, is really one of those that in a really dark time in my life really helped me. Um, through probably one of the biggest spiritual crises I ever had. Um, so I want to talk to you about the story that led up to it, uh, but it's a story I've never done from the pulpit, so just bear with me, okay? Um, we're going to flash back to 2003. Um, I, at this point, am just about to finish my political science degree, um, and I'm working in D.C. as an intern at this point uh, for an advocacy group that was trying to sort of bring down some of the rhetoric, particularly around the homosexuality thing, saying, hey, people on the right, people on the left, I know there's a big disagreement, but aren't there some things we could all agree on, like murdering people's bad? You know, let's start with the basics. Uh, and most of the folks I'm working with are, are Christians. Most of the folks I'm working with are very, very, very faithful folks. Um, even those who weren't Christian were very, very faithful folks. Um, and when I'm working with them, we get this, we get word. We get word of a horrible idea. We have a group of folks, they were a group of, let's go with Christians. Um, that's what they would call themselves. Uh, who, who wanted to erect a statue glorifying the murderers, so the people who murdered somebody, um, of Matthew Shepard. Now, those of you who don't know your recent past, Matthew Shepard was a gay man who was brutally hunted down and murdered and then literally put out for display by a group of extremists. Okay. We're not going to go into the details. You can Google it if that's what you want. And this group of Christians wanted to erect a statue in a park across from his parents glorifying the murderers as good people. Now, this is not a right or a left thing, right? I have good friends who are solidly on the right on this issue. I have good friends solidly on the left of this issue, okay? And I will tell you that we can all agree brutally murdering someone not okay. We can all agree that erecting the statue glorifying the murderers of a person's kid in the park across from their house is not okay. That's not a right, that's not a left thing, that's a wacko, hate-filled thing. We can all agree. I don't care who you voted for, we can all agree on that. That's not okay. People need to be allowed to grieve. People shouldn't be murdered. For any reason. So we were suing them to try to keep them from being able to get their darn statue in there that they had built. Okay. And it gotten super complicated and they had learned that we were suing them as you do. And so they got in a caravan, they drove up to DC where we were working and all we got for the weeks preceding was death threat, death threat, death threat, death threat. Um, and all of them quoted scripture and all of them talked about how it was their Christian duty to come up there, find us and kill us all. And because when you're 20, you can confuse courage and brashness. Uh, we as interns all decided on the day that they were going to come to stage uh, what they had said would be a violent protest. That we would all show up in solidarity with everyone at our office and we would stand there on the third floor and watch as this thing uh, played out. Even though all our bosses were like, guys, stay home, this could get ugly. But you know, when you're 20, you think you're going to live forever. And so we all went and we all showed up and frankly, none of us got work done that day. We looked down at a whole bunch of folks carrying Bibles, given sermons, to which the conclusion was, if we can find those folks, meaning us, we're going to kill them all because God wants us to. You may ask, how does this create a spiritual dilemma? How does this create a spiritual crisis? See, here's the thing. As I sat up, stood up there and looked down at these folks, they quoted the Bible I read. They named the God I love. And then proclaimed a 
horrible, horrible unchristian message of hate, of extremism. A message that called for murder. But then I realized something. That there was probably someone down there screaming all sorts of unchurched language at us. Looking up at us in our window as we look down. Who probably thought to themselves, how does that guy up there read the same Bible I do? Pray to the same God I do? And yet it's standing up there, trying to stop us. It took a few weeks before the tension bubbled up, the spiritual pain bubbled up. But I started realizing there was a question, a question I didn't know how to answer, which is, how do I know if I'm faithful? Because that dude that day down there in that park, if you had asked him, he thought he was doing a faithful thing. That dude that day in that park, if you had asked him, was he doing the will of God? He would have said yes. That day in that building on the third floor, if he had asked any of us if we were doing the will of God, we would have said yes. So how do we know who is the actual faithful one? How do I know that I'm faithful? How do you know that you're faithful? I struggled with this for nearly a year. Really, really struggled with it. Um, until I talked to a good, amazing spiritual director, um, and I was stuck on this issue, and she, yes, she, um, suggested an answer. She went to this Bible verse, and she said, those folks we're doing exactly what those folks were going to do. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you've told me some of them were Klan members, some of them were neo-Nazis, some of them were all sorts of different extremist groups. I said, yeah, absolutely. Most of them had histories with different extremist groups, right? And I said, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I said, well, it ain't news when the Klan wants to kill someone, because that's what the Klan does. It isn't news when Nazis want to kill someone, because that's what Nazis do. It is news when Christians spend money, resources, time, and put their lives at risk to help somebody they've never met, that they might not agree with. There are people in my office on all sorts of different sides of the political spectrum. And I realized that when it comes to asking the question of, am I being faithful? The way you can ask yourself, and I'm going to say right now, you can only ask this of yourself. You cannot ask this of other people because you cannot know what is in other people's hearts, okay? At least not generally. Sometimes people reveal it, like on that day in that park. But you can ask the question, what is it that I am doing that I otherwise wouldn't do if not for faith? What is it that I am doing that if someone was to see a briefing book about who I am would go, oh, well, that's interesting. That's different. I wouldn't have expected that. That was a particularly merciful thing or a particularly brave thing or a particularly courageous thing or a particularly loving thing that you wouldn't have think that that person would have done because they didn't have to. They did it. 
because of faith. And if you can look back at your journey of faith, and you can point to these moments where you did something beyond what someone like you, whoever that is, would be expected to do, that, that's the Holy Spirit at work. That's God at work. That's faith at work. Because you can never tell where faith is. You can only look back and see what it has done. So if you ever find yourself asking the question, am I faithful? Which is, by the way, a question, if you've never asked yourself, you should. Then look back at your life. Look back at your actions and say, what have I done that I otherwise wouldn't have done without faith? Because folks, atheists can feed the poor. Folks, atheists can do anything us Christians do. You can be an atheist and show up to church every week. But what do you do that is different because of faith? If you have an answer to that, put it in the comment line. I'd love to know. Or email me, prmatt at firstunitedelca.org. Because I'd love to hear your stories of faith. Now for the Apostles' Creed. Let us confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Before we go to prayers of the people, um, quick explanation. Those of you who've watched me do prayers of the people before know that I generally first pray for countries in crisis, or peoples in crisis, hurricanes, things like that. And then I pray for people in our own community. Um, today, they're going to really overlap. Um, what you may not know is that the country of Myanmar was illegally overthrown by their own military. Their military grabbed most, if not all, their elected officials and threw them in jail. And then continued to grab citizens off the street in the middle of the night, terrorizing anyone who would oppose their um, military junta, um, their, their illegal coup that was led. 
Now you may say, Pastor, I get it, but isn't that something far, far away from Sheboygan, Wisconsin? I mean, Myanmar? But see, it isn't. Because we have people, in fact, a large number of folks in Sheboygan who are from Myanmar. And not just a large number of folks in Sheboygan and in Sheboygan County, but a large number of folks in our congregation. And what this means for them is that they have brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles and cousins who are trapped in a country gripped by the terror of their own military. So we're going to take some time and pray for them today during that country in crisis part of my prayers. But know that the reason we're doing that is because that country is also us. For we have people in our community scared for their loved ones. Dear Heavenly Father, please warm the hearts of those commanders in Myanmar who have seized the government illegally. Have them do what they have told the UN that they will do and release the prisoners. Have them do what they told the UN they would do and have them release the citizens they've illegally detained. Have them do what they have told the UN they would do. Which was to go ahead and leave public life and fulfill their moral, ethical, and constitutional duty by being neutral. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also pray today for all those who are suffering here and around Sheboygan. We pray especially for Gail, Kim, Sandy, Pat, Dennis, Ellen, Fran, Marion, Ginny, Vicki, Linda, Mary, Rick, Paula, Becky, Julie, Ben, Sue, Lori, Maddie, Carol, Donna, Alex, Sally, Craig, Patty, David, Robert, Wendy, Betty, Ron, Jim, Randy, Wally, Dick, Marlene. We also give thanks today for the birth of baby girl Harper, Lori, born to Abby and Aaron. May uh, the Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. May our prayers rise like incense before you today and every day. Amen. We've gone to that part of worship where we do the passing of the peace, but obviously, being a little virtual, it's a little bit different. So what you can do is you can hit the hug emoji if you're on Facebook. That's the little emoji with the heart. Or you could go ahead and just say, peace be with you. And other people say, and also with you. So the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you.
now for the prayer of dedication. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places. You meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us begin the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Now for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Just a quick reminder, please make sure you have your elements um, in hand, your bread and your wine or grape juice uh, for the next part because you now take it from here and do the communion portion at home. Now for the prayer after communion. God of steadfast love, at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Jesus Christ, for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you, that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and share the good news. Thanks be to God. Amen.